Good morning, everyone. We're going to wait just one more minute to see if we've got more people coming, creeping in the back door, and then we will begin. It's lovely to see you all on screen this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Holy Sepulchre Church. My name is Amanda. And uh, as we come to share life together with God and to worship him and to realign ourselves and give ourselves a little bit of space to say that, God, you are important in our lives. Of course, this is a massive day for our nation, maybe. <laughs> Maybe it will be a massive day of celebration and coming together and maybe it will be a massive day of disappointment. But God, you are never disappointing. Let's pray and then we're going to have some worship in song led by Tom and welcome Tom. Thanks. It's good to see you here. And this morning we're going to hear from Rachel in uh, a teaching session as well. Let's pray. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all this morning. Holy Spirit, prompt us to listen to your voice and truly hear. And Father God, we pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. Amen. Thanks, Tom. Praise is rising, minds are turning to you, we turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you, we long for you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Hello. 
your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name and on that day when my strength is fading Angels near, my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul, worship his whole. Name sing like ever before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like ever before. Oh, my soul. of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining. Thank you. 
Radiant King of Light, with splendor you are crowned. What wonderful words, Lord. The power of God is moving in power and grace and kindness. Lord, we welcome you this morning. We want to set aside this time to put you on your throne if you have fallen off in our understanding we want to come before your throne and worship you in truth and in spirit thank you lord we're going to pray for our world and our nation and for us as individuals as well in our community lord we pray for our world where COVID is still ravaging South Asia and South America in particular. Lord, be with communities, help them to find ways to cope, to get help where they need it, for governments to act with probity and swiftness and generosity to those in need. We are so conscious, Lord, that around the world, it is the poor who suffer most and who will have the least access to vaccines. Lord, prompt our nation to be generous. Lord, we pray for Christians meeting around the world in many different circumstances. We think of John Claude in Burundi we think of Christians meeting in Yemen and Iraq, in North Korea, Lord, in other places where it's dangerous to proclaim your name, and yet they do. Give them strength. And Lord, give us the vigor and the excitement about you that no matter what happens, we are proud to call ourselves sons and daughters of God. Help us never to apologize for our faith, Lord, because we see the example of so many Christians around the world who love you with their whole hearts in the midst of danger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation, Lord, which is caught up in wonderful excitement about football and it's a great unifier, Lord. And we do long to be united and generous as a nation, but we want to say to you, God, that it's never going to happen based on football. There are songs and there's excitement and there's joy and there's hugging, but it's not in your name, Lord. And we want to proclaim that nothing is as good Nothing is as powerful, nothing is as mighty as your wonderful name. So as we enjoy the company of friends or watch football tonight, or maybe assiduously avoid football, Lord, because we don't particularly like it, may we always know that you are the highest joy in our lives and in the life of our nation. And Lord, finally, we pray for us. So many of us are going through change in our lives in the coming months and in the past few months, not just to do with COVID, Lord, but moving house, having babies, seeking work. I want to pray for Steph and Fumi, Lord. Be with them as they search for a new home and a school for a liar. Lord, we pray for Abu in Georgia, setting out on a new venture with you, keen to show refugees in Georgia that you love them. We pray for Tessa and Ruth and Nick and all the staff of our church. Give them real focus and determination and 
strategy and vision, Lord, as they lead us. And we pray for Gloria and Paul having a new baby. Be with Gloria in particular. Give her physical health, give her mental strength as she copes with Abigail and enjoys motherhood and looks forward to, to the arrival of another baby. Be with them as a family, Lord. Lord, in the silence, we want to pray for the people whom we love, who are on our hearts right now. And we're going to join together with the words of the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. A simple prayer, but which encapsulates all we need to reach out to you. Please unmute and uh, we can say the prayer together and make a lovely cacophony of noise, praising your name and calling out to our Father in heaven. Let's pray. Our Father, our in, Father heaven, in heaven, hallowed be, be your name. name. Your, kingdom your kingdom come, come. Your, your will, will be, done. be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us, give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive us our and sins, as, as we forgive, forgive those who sin against us. And lead us, us not into faith. temptation, deliver but deliver us from evil. evil. The kingdom, the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. 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 Welcome again to Holy Sepulchre. If you have arrived um, in this time since I welcomed everybody at the beginning, if you'd like to put yourselves back onto mute now, I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes and that's the way it works most effectively online. But after the service, we will have time to chat and fellowship and uh, pray for each other as well. If you would like that, I'll tell you more about that at the end of the service. But um, we're going to read the Bible. We have two wonderful passages to read. And then we're going to hear from Rachel, who is one of the leaders of our church. And uh, she's going to be talking about Amos and Ephesians. So we're going to hear first Amos chapter seven. And Tessa is going to read it for us. Amos chapter 7 verses 7 to 9 or 15? It's 15, it's just on two screens, I'm sorry. Lovely, perfect, okay great. <laughs> verses 7 to 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb, plumb line among my people, Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, get out, you seer, go back to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the New Testament in the book of Ephesians, 
and we're in chapter one starting at verse three and it's on the screen in the new international version praise be to the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in christ for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through jesus christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of god's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under christ thanks tessa and amanda good morning everybody I, have, I went up the road this morning. I don't know if anyone else has been out. There are a lot of England shirts out for a very early time on a Sunday morning. But we've got a much more exciting passage to look at this morning. Amos chapter 7. Now, on the 28th of August, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. stood up and addressed the crowd by the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. He famously repeated the words many times, I have a dream, in his iconic speech, talking about how he dreamt of equality at a time when the US was rife with racial injustice. In part of his speech, Martin Luther King said, no, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. The words justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream are words straight from the mouth of the prophet Amos. And as Martin Luther King Jr. stood up to the injustices of his era, Amos the prophet raged prophetically against those of the people of Israel. And in today's talk, I'd like us to learn more about the book of Amos, but also understand why God's message through Amos is still relevant to us today in 21st century London. To understand the relevance of the message, I think it's helpful to know some context. In verse 14 of our passage, we read that Amos didn't come from a family of prophets. Instead, it says he was a shepherd and keeper of fig trees. In Amos chapter one, verse one, Amos describes himself as a sheep reader from a place called Tekoa. Tekoa was a town in the kingdom of Judah, a few miles south of Jerusalem. And when God called Amos to prophesy, he moved north to the kingdom of Israel. Amos chapter 1 verse 1 also tells us that Amos prophesied two years before the earthquake when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Joash was king of Israel. Putting the crossover of years between the reigns of Uzziah and Jeroboam who was Jeroboam the second we can work out that Amos's prophecy occurs sometime in the period between 767 and 753 BC. So in a biblical timeline, it was about 250 years after the reign of King David and just under 200 years since Israel and Judah had splintered into two nations, about 20 years after Jonah had prophesied and about 10 to 20 years before Isaiah prophesied. And it was about 20 to 30 years before the Assyrians started to take the Jews from the kingdom of Israel into captivity and over a hundred years before the Jews from Judah were taken into captivity in Babylon. To get a better idea of what life was like under the kings Uzziah and Jeroboam II, we need to go back to the books in the Bible of Chronicles and Kings. 2 Chronicles 26 tells us that Uzziah became a king aged 16 years and he reigned for 52 years. And to begin with, as it recorded in 2 Chronicles 26 verse 24, the Bible says that Uzziah did right in the eyes of the Lord. 
But then later on, he became powerful and his pride led to his downfall and he was unfaithful to God. He ended his life with leprosy, which meant that he was excluded from the temple of God. Jeroboam II features in 2 Kings chapter 14. He was described as doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. However, we know that notwithstanding his evil's acts, he also had military success in restoring Damascus and Hamath back to Israel. Economically, in Israel, the kingdom of the north, it was a time of financial prosperity for some. Amos chapter 5 talks of the rich having built mansions and lush vineyards. Amos chapter 6 describes the complacent as long beds inlaid with ivory, people dining on choice fattened lambs, wine being drunk by the bowlful, and the use of finest lotions. Yet amongst all of this opulence, there was social injustice. In Amos chapter 2, the needy are sold for the price of a pair of sandals. Women are abused. There's idolatry. Chapter 4, the poor are oppressed and the needy are crushed. Chapter 5, the poor are denied justice in the courts. And whilst the people of Israel may practice what could be called religious practices, burning sacrifices, bringing their tithes and free will offerings, they're doing it so they can brag about what they've done, but not with hearts who seek justice or who seek to glorify the Lord. And it's into this situation that God calls Amos from his sheep breeding and tending of fig trees to go and prophesy. He's called to hear from God and speak out against the social justice and the sin which is occurring in the kingdom of Israel. To begin with, in the first two chapters of Amos, Amos speaks out God's judgment on Israel's neighboring nations. But then at the end of chapter two, Amos's prophecy turns his attention to Israel and what God says over that nation. He starts by putting Israel on a par with those nations, but actually his criticism of Israel is longer and much more intense than the other nations, which he's previously spoken about. He expresses the injustice of what is happening in Israel and reminds the people of Israel how God has rescued them from slavery in Egypt, but how the Israelites appear to have forgotten all that and are now living in a culture of sin and injustice. Chapters three to six go on to God calling out the actions and the behaviors of the people of Israel and how he hates them and how he's going to call them to account for their religious hypocrisy, their ne neglect of the poor, their worship of God, which lacks authenticity because it doesn't marry up with how people are being treated and their idolatry. And to be frank, it's not pretty. The words which Amos speaks aren't sugar soaked. God calls out the sins of Israel for what they are and inevitably that they deserve God's punishment. And it's against this background we reach today's verses in Amos chapter 7. In verses 7 to 9, the picture of the Lord standing by a wall that's been built true to plumb is a figurative representation of the kingdom of Israel, which has been well constructed and built by God. For those of you who aren't DIY or building enthusiasts, a plumb line is a piece of string with a weight on it. So if you attach the string at the top of the wall and let the weight dangle, you can see if the wall is straight or not. So Amos's vision is of God setting the plumb line amongst the kingdom of Israel to judge them and to bring consequences for their wrongdoing. And then it will lead to their destruction and ruin. When Amos says later on in verse 11 that the people of Israel will be sent into exile away from their native land, we know that's exactly what does happen. Subsequently, the Assyrian monarchs conquered part of the kingdom of Israel, with Israelites being taken captive approximately 20 to 30 years later, and then the complete demise of Israel by the, by the later Assyrian kings about 10 years after that. So the destruction and the ruin promised by God in Amos chapter 7 happens. Therefore, in some respects, we could just say that the book of Amos is about God through his prophet um, uh, de predicting the demise of the kingdom of Israel. And yes, this passage does that, but it also tells us so much more about God's judgment and punishment for those who allow social injustice and those who don't live up to God's standard. I don't know if you're familiar with the book of Amos and perhaps I don't know what your reaction was when you heard those verses from Amos this morning. When I first read it, if I'm allowed to say this, I, I actually didn't really like the words I was reading. 
Where was the loving, gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and rich in love that seems to feature in many sermons? Where was the God who in our second passage from Ephesians has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing? What a contrast there is between that passage in Ephesians and the words in the book of Amos. Here in chapter seven, verse seven of Amos, God is saying he's had enough of Israel and their actions and he will spare them no longer. And if you read uh, the rest of Amos, it feels as if the God which we encounter is a God of judgment. And when I was preparing this, I thought, well, if you're going to preach a sermon on God's judgment and punishment, it doesn't immediately feel like it's going to be a crowd pleaser. It feels so much more difficult to talk about a God who judges than a God who loves. And particularly, I feel a, a difficult message to bring in our cultural surroundings, which in many circumstances, it feels like culturally it's not OK to say something is wrong or not how God intended it to be, because that can come across as uh, being a liberal or perhaps not very tolerant, which seems very countercultural in many ways. But standing back, if there is social injustice, religious hypocrisy, inequality of rights, isn't it right that if God is just and fair, that he should call out that wrongdoing for what it is and not stand for it? And isn't it right that God should ensure that the wrongdoing is punished? This week, the media has reported two separate cases at the Old Bailey, where three young women have been murdered in gruesome and horrific circumstances. The perpetrators of those crimes will receive a punishment in accordance with what they've done. I don't know about you, but I would say that it's right and just they should do so. If they could kill without consequence, I would be outraged at the lack of justice. So thinking about judgment and punishment in this way, isn't it right that if the people of the kingdom of Israel were acting unjustly, abusing the poor and exploiting the weak, that God's judgment and punishment to the kingdom of Israel should follow. So rather than having a reaction of not perhaps liking God being a God of judgment, does it change? Are we actually pleased that God is proposing to act in this way and bring an end to the evil and just injustice that Amos is confronting? Let's hold that thought. We'll come back to it in the moment. But before we do, I just want to touch upon the second part of our reading from Amos. I started off the talk this morning mentioning Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. About four months before that speech, Martin Luther King was in a jail in Birmingham, Alabama. He'd been imprisoned following a nonviolent protest against racial segregation. Something today that we would find absolutely abhorrent to think that somebody could be imprisoned for a nonviolent protest against racial segregation. But whilst he was in jail, some clergymen wrote to the local newspaper, the Birmingham Mail, criticising the protests as unwise and untimely. Their suggestion being that the non-violent process, that protest that Martin Luther King was organising were not legal. When I read this, I was immediately struck that when you stand up against sin and wrongdoing, it often comes with opposition, as with the second part of our Amos passage today, where Amaziah tries to stir up trouble against Amos, and accuses him of trying to stir up a conspiracy against the kingdom of Israel in verse 10. In our passage, Amaziah is described as a priest of Bethel. Bethel in Hebrew means house of God. And in the earlier chapters of the Old Testament, there are many mentions of how Bethel was a holy place. But when the kingdoms of Israel and Judah split after the death of Solomon, the first king of Jeroboam made two calves of gold and set one up in Bethel. So Amaziah is a priest of idolatry who tries to raise up opposition against Amos. Now, perhaps it's unsurprising that when Amos is challenging the sin and wrongdoing and reflecting God's view of injustice uh, that, uh, and, um, and, and criticising and, and calling it out for what it is, that Amaziah kicks up a fuss and stirs up trouble. And in the face of the truth of what Amos is saying, Amaziah starts to lie about what Amos is saying, saying that he's stirring up a conspiracy against King Jeroboam II. This is a spiritual attack occurring against Amos. When we stand up for what is right and truthful and just, as God wants us to do, 
often that can lead to a spiritual attack. Now, in response, Amos says in verses 14 to 15 that all he has done has heard God's call and responded to it. And that's what we need to do. We need to respond to God's call. And if we do so, there will be times of opposition and also lies. It happened to Jesus when he was in the wilderness in the New Testament. And as we've read in our passage today, it happened to Amos. But when you're acting for righteousness and truth, standing firm in the face of opposition and lies, and it can feel really difficult and often close to soul, soul destroying, it might even leave you doubting what God has called you to do. But if you're obedient to God and you stand up for truth and justice, then we know, as we see from the, uh, the passage in Amos, that however difficult it may be, God will be with you and will help you to stand firm. Now, I said we'd return to the idea of God's judgment, and I'd like us to finish with thinking about that and what it means for us. Returning to the idea that God has declared judgment on the kingdom of Israel and the destruction and ruin which will follow as a consequence of their wrongdoing. And if we come to the conclusion that actually what God was doing was right, then it's impossible to ignore that we too deserve punishment for our wrongdoing as well. If we agree that God was right to bring judgment and punishment on the people of the kingdom of Israel for their litany of sins as set out in Amos, the reality is that same judgment and punishment should also apply to us. We too live in a time where there's social injustice, which God hates and everything is not as God intended it to be. If God applied his plumb line, we wouldn't measure up either. Whilst we might not be committing the acts detailed in the book of Amos, we might be allowing them to occur without challenge. When Martin Luther King Jr. was in the Birmingham jail and the letter criticizing his actions was sent to the local paper, he then wrote himself, himself wrote a letter from Birmingham jail in response. And one of the points he made in that letter is that whilst there were Ku, Ku Klux Klaners or white citizen councillors who promoted racial segregation and wanted that system to continue, there were also moderates who disagreed with what was happening, but didn't do anything to stand up to it. His letter, in his letter, he also drew an analogy with the German Nazi regime and challenged as to whether if you were in Nazi Germany, would it have been an appropriate response to just allow the injustice to occur? Or should you as a Christian stood up, stand up to what was going on? Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the regime in Nazi Germany is on a par with 21st century Britain. But the point is that when social injustice occurs in our nation, in our world, we also bear responsibility for those injustices, particularly if we let them occur without any challenge. And the consequence of any sin is bleak. In Romans chapter six, it says the consequences of all sin is death. Earlier in Romans, Paul says we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Each of us in our own way fails to live our lives in the way that God intended. I think this was an example that Sandy Miller, the former vicar of Holy Trinity Brompton, had a good way of demonstrating how we'd all fallen short. So I know we're all sitting in our homes, but I want you to imagine that at this moment in time, we were in our church building at Holy Sepulchre. And if you're in the building at the moment, to the left and the right of the main aisle, there are five pillars on each side. And the pillars are connected to the ceiling arches. And the top of each pillar is about one meter underneath the ceiling. So I want you to imagine, pick a pillar, and thinking about that pillar alone, let's think of that pillar as being a scale of sinful people. So the people who've skin, sinned the most are at the bottom of the pillar, and those who've sinned little might be towards the top. So you might put, I don't know, Hitler at the bottom of the pillar, and then you might put Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King Jr. towards the top. I'm sure you'd be a little bit further down from Mother Teresa just above me. But the point is that God's standard isn't up to the top of the pillar. His standard is the sky. So we've all sinned and fallen short and wouldn't be on the right side of God's plumb line. That's the case. If we just look at uh, Amos, our futures are bleak. We all deserve judgment and punishment, just like the people of the kingdom of Israel. But if we looked at the book of Amos and thought that's it, God is only a God who dishes out judgment and punishment, 
It would, of course, be a bit like watching the first half of tonight's football match, believing that the story only goes as far as the halftime whistle and not watching it through to the end to know the actual result, even if there are penalties. Because the Bible tells us that there's a second half to the story and it's really good news. If you go on to the end of the book of Amos, we read that notwithstanding all their wrongdoing and evil acts, God doesn't leave the people of Israel in a place without hope. He talks of there being a restoration of the kingdom of Israel, and that restoration comes in the person of Jesus Christ. We may deserve judgment and punishment, but we don't receive it. Instead, out of love, God sends Jesus to take the punishment in our place. Ephesians 1, our second passage, summarizes what God has done. Verse 7, in him we have redemption, in him, that's in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. What a stark contrast to Amos, where our sin deserves judgment and punishment. God then lets and allows and provides forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And it isn't some half-hearted begrudging forgiveness. As we read in the passage in Ephesians, Jesus' death brings our adoption to sonship, our total acceptance into God's family. So whilst judgment and punishment should be the right consequence for our sin, the second half of the story is one of forgiveness and redemption and being in right relationship with God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Compared to what we deserve and what we actually get from God, I don't know, I feel so grateful thinking about what I get from God compared to what I should get. So I'd like us to finish by giving thanks to God for all that he's done by hearing that passage from Ephesians again. And so I'd like you to close your eyes and just listen and thank God. And then after we, I've read this passage, Tom will lead us in some worship in response. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Say.
mercy and grace are mine. Forgiven is my sin. Jesus, my only hope, the Savior of the world. Grace is the Lord, we cry. God, let your kingdom come. Your word has let me see. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, Lord, that you've saved us. Mm. All our actions, everything that we're not proud of, all our mistakes, mm. for, for not standing up sometimes, for not standing up in the face of injustice, for being hypocrites. Mm. To be in the people that you didn't make us to be. And Lord, we're sorry for that. And as long as we're sorry, Lord, you save us. You set your hope in us. And Lord, that, that just gives us this blanket of love. that we can put over our shoulders, wrap round us in times where we must stand up, in times where we need a bit of encouragement. We can't suffer worse than you suffered for us. So Lord, I pray, just give us that comfort at all times, especially in 21st century London. You know, tonight when the football's on, when you're, you know, when everyone's swearing, drinking, shouting, I pray, Lord, you're with us and that we can just stand up to that, be our true selves. Mm -hmm and show a bit of you in us. Sounds not much, but Lord, I think it's quite a lot for some of us. Mm. I can vouch for that. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rachel and Tom, for weaving together God's 
love and justice so effectively in um, the message and in the, the, the songs and in the prayers as well that um, they're inextricably linked and that we um, we often as Rachel said like to talk about God being un, you know unfair because we don't get what we want but in fact if we actually got God's justice rained down on us it would um, be like those passages in Amos and we thank God so much for the gift of his son and forgiveness. We're going to um, have a chance to have breakout rooms. If you would like to pray about anything that Rachel has said or anything that's on your heart, then please can you message Ruth, who is called Holy Sepulchre London, um, which is a nice name change, I think. It, it, um, Sums up Ruth's general holiness. <laughs> but please, please send a message in chat to Ruth if you would like to have someone pray with you about anything at all, but particularly about anything that Rachel said or that we've covered this morning. Maybe you're an Italian and you would really like prayer about the football. I, I don't know. Um, but all of us, all the, the rest of us are going to go into breakout rooms to have a bit of um, fellowship, which is what we tend, tend to talk about in Christian circles, isn't it? It's just friendship and uh, community together. Unfortunately, not over a cup of tea, unless you have madly made one um, during the service. So a couple of announcements, which are really important and are really part of our community. The wellbeing journey, which a number of us have been involved with, finishes this week. So um, the last session, don't miss it. Um, there are various days that it's on. And uh, if you need any assistance on that, um, then please contact the office of the church or Rachel. But there are going to be more courses later on in the year, um, which sort of follow up from those sorts of big thoughts about how do we live our lives in times of change. So keep an eye out for that. Secondly, lots of you will have enjoyed Focus, which is a sort of a Christian family camp held in about the first week of the school holidays each year. This year it is happening, but it will be online from the 23rd to the 25th of July. And you can look up Focus at Home online to find out more about it. But Rachel is organising a mini Focus in-person camping experience on the weekend at a on a farm in West Berkshire. And she has even arranged for sunshine. She has told me that. So if you would like to attend the weekend or visit for the day, can you please contact Rachel, rachel at hsl.church. It sounds really interesting. It's only a couple of weeks away. And normally we talk about focus for months ahead because we have to save up and we have to get organized. This time it's really easy to be involved online. Um, and also, if you would like to go away for a weekend, then please contact Rachel really quickly. Normal services this week on Tuesday and Wednesday, they're on the screen. We also have a women in prayer, um, prayer time um, on Monday the 19th of July, it will be the last one before a summer break. So if you'd like to know more about that, then contact um, the office or me. Uh, one last thing, uh, we mentioned Abu in our prayers, we mention countries around the world that are in persecution. We support a number of ministries and charities and works around the world and in our nation that address injustice and help uh, the people who are suffering for their faith in one way or another. We also support very local projects for homeless people. We can't do that without money. If you would like to give to the work of the church, you can do so online. You may already give regularly and we thank you for that and God thanks you. But if you would like to give regularly, then go to the web reference there, the URL that's on the screen, because as we all know, um, money helps us to do good in the community. We're going to finish with a blessing and then we'll be put into chat rooms. Let's pray.
May God's goodness and hope sustain us all this week. May we take your presence, Lord, to others so that they can find your goodness and hope also. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Ruth is going to do her tricks and um, put us into breakout rooms. It's been lovely to see you all on screen and uh, we hope you have a wonderful week, whether you can stay or not. And uh, yeah, enjoy the football if that's your thing. Enjoy the tennis, enjoy the cycling. This is a, a time of great sporting